I'd like to collect some data from you on your various behavioral traits that make you all individuals, okay? So please raise your hand if you're right-handed. Okay, now I want you to interdigitate your fingers like this and look and see which thumb is on top. So raise your hand if it's the right thumb that's on top. Okay, so it's different people, you may have noticed. All right, now I'm going to pose a hypothetical question, which is, if I had two rooms next to each other, and you had to spend your time in one of them, and one smelled very strongly of artificial rose, and the other one smelled very strongly of artificial banana, which one would you spend your time in? So raise your hand if it's the rose room. Okay, about half of you. Anyway, so... <laughs> These are simple behavioral questions that I've put to you. These are ways in which you are all individual and different from each other. And I'm going to tell you about our research into the neurobiology of individuality. That is, what are the biological processes that give rise to this diversity that we saw when we did this survey. And my name is Ben DeBevor. I'm a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology. I'm in the Center for Brain Science at Harvard. And I'd also like to recognize the members of my lab who have done the research that I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is from left to right. It's Kyobi, Chiruni, Kyle, Jamila, Sean, Chelsea, Jamie, Zach, and Matt. All individuals. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to introduce... Here's a fourth behavioral question, which is, instead of coming to, to Brookline here for this event, what if we'd taken you out to an open expanse like this salt flat, put a blindfold on your head, and given you the instruction to walk straight. How well do you think you would do with this? I see some shaking heads. And that's the right answer. So people are actually very bad at this. They end up walking in circles. So this, this individual here walked about four miles in circles. Very little ability to go straight. Here's somebody else. This person did a little better, but it's still very meandery, and it's a mix of left and right turns. And this is actually the behavior we study in my lab. So here you can see an automated tracking video. This is an individual exploring this Y-shaped maze. And the computer and the camera system is recognizing every time they go through the center of the maze, do they end up making a left or a right turn? And you can imagine running this experiment for, say, two hours and collecting data that looks like this. So here are five individuals. And each row has either purple ticks or green ticks. And the purple ticks indicate turns to the left and greens indicate turn, green ticks indicate turns to the right, right? And so the top individual there, number one, makes predominantly left turns. The bottom individual makes predominantly right turns. And you can imagine a simple metric, the right bias there, which is the percentage of turns that are to the right. So this varies hugely from 20% to 80% for these individuals here. The most common individuals are choosing around 50% of the time. And in my lab, we do genetic experiments, and what they've allowed us to do is identify regions of the brain which control this diversity of behavior. So these are neurons in the brain, and when these neurons are active like normal, you see that diversity that I showed you in the previous slide. But when these neurons are manipulated, when we make them silent, the brain is otherwise normal, but these neurons go silent, the diversity goes up, right? So you get stronger lefties and stronger righties, and everybody gets a little bit more different from each other. So in a sense, this is like a conformity neuron. When these neurons are active the way that they are evolved in the brain to be active, everybody acts more similarly to each other. But then we alter the neurons and they become more different from each other. Now the twist, which maybe you anticipated, is this is happening in a, not the brain of a human, uh, but a, a brain that can fit comfortably within the eye of a needle. And this is the brain of the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. So just think that when you're trying to clear these guys out of your garbage, that every one of them has this complicated brain and exhibits unique individual behaviors to each fly. Now, why would we do these experiments in flies and not people if people show this behavioral diversity as well? Well, we can do all sorts of things. We can look at hundreds of flies at once. We can make sure that every fly that we look at has the same DNA, has the same genome, right? So we can give them identical genetics and we can also grow them in the lab in, in identical conditions. So there's nothing different about their environment that would explain their behavioral differences, and there's nothing different about their genes that would explain their behavioral differences. So the diversity I showed you with the, the pink and green lines was from flies that all had identical genomes and all had identical environments. 
The other nice thing about flies is we can do this in high throughput. They're small. So there's the, the, the movie you saw already on the left. We do this in 120 flies simultaneously with one camera. That's the middle movie. And we're developing robots now to automate our experiments for us. All right, now I'm a diehard scientist, so I want to show you some data. And what this is is now a plot of that right turn bias score. And this bar is summarizing a population. The height of the bar is the average value. And as I said, the most average flies are 50-50. So you see that bar comes out at 50-50. But the white bracket there indicates the diversity of behavior in the population. Right? 65% of all the flies have turn bias scores within that bracket. And that's what we're starting with. These are the flies that are all genetically identical. And here's an experiment you can do in flies, but not in people, which is to take mom and dad that have the same trait and mate them to each other. Right? So we took two lefty flies here. You can see down at the bottom. They have right turn scores that are very low, mated them to each other, and then collected all their progeny, so all their babies. And this was their behavior. It went back to 0.5. It's like choosing parents that were lefties had no influence at all on the behavior of their progeny. Right? So this is another indication that genetic differences between these flies do not account for their behavioral differences. This was true over a number of different crosses, and you can select for righty parents, and in all cases, you get 50-50 flies back. All right, so where does this diversity come from if it's not differences in genetics or environment? Well, I showed you this brain earlier, and this is a complicated organ. Even in flies, it has 200,000 neurons, and they all have to come from a single cell, the fertilized egg. So there's this intricate process of the cell dividing and dividing again and dividing again and wiring up all these neurons to each other. And you can imagine that through this process, there's many moments where slight deviations that come from random events at the molecular and cellular level could change the way this adult brain is wired up. So you can think about fruit flies as precious snowflakes. All of these snowflakes came from the same storm. Right? They're all made of water, so they all have the same genetic material. They all came from the same environment, and yet they all came out slightly differently because of the random process by which they moved through little micro-environments, like slight humidity changes or slight temperature changes. All right, so I've told you now a lot about left-right locomotion. And you may think, this is a peculiar behavior to spend a lot of time studying. <laughs> <laughs> but we looked at other behaviors. So we've looked at wing folding. This is maybe a bit like when you put your, your hands together. We've looked at temperature preference, startle response. And I'm going to bring uh, the end of the talk to look at odor preference in flies. Now, I asked you if you'd prefer a room that smelled like artificial rose or artificial banana. This is a test we've given to the flies. And just like you, about half of them prefer to be in the rose and half of them prefer to be in the banana. So what we'd like to do next, instead of describing the factors that explain the diversity of the behavior, is ask, can we predict the preference of an individual? Can we look into its brain and say, this fly right here prefers to be in banana, and this fly over here likes to be in rose? So the way we do this is by looking at how odors are represented inside the brain of the flies. And what I'm showing you here is for fly number one, these are eight regions where odor information is processed. These are clusters of synapses, so that's the, the junction between two neurons where information exchange happens, and they're called glomeruli. And odor information is encoded in the pattern of neural activity that happens across these glomeruli. All right, so what happens is we flow some geranyl acetate, which smells like rose, over the flies, and with our two-photon calcium imaging microscope, we look at the activity pattern of these neurons, right? And so here, red and orange indicate neurons that have become more active in, resp in response to the geranyl acetate, and blue indicates neurons that have become less active. If we give that same fly to heptanone, which smells like banana, we get a different pattern of activation. You can see it's a different pattern of, of uh, blue and red across these processing units. Okay? And so that's how the fly knows the difference between these two odors, is because there's a different pattern of brain activation. Now, what happens if we bring a second fly in? Well, the second fly has the same processing regions, 
okay? But does it respond the same way to these odors that fly number one did? So here, if we give both flies now banana odor, what we have found is that the different glomeruli have different responses across animals. So if we look at glomerulus number three here, in fly number one, it got less active, but in fly number two, it got more active. And so what this is telling us is not only do the animals have different behaviors, but the way that their brain perceives the environment is different from animal to animal. Okay, so how do we get back to humans and talking about explaining behavioral diversity and individuality? We accept that nature and nurture are strong determinants of behavior in individuals. Your genes do matter, and your environment does matter. But there's a third component, and this is inexorable randomness. There's this process by which you build an organism from a single cell, and it imparts differences to us that cannot be predicted by deterministic influences of nature and nurture. And this is what makes us all individuals. Thank you.